So uh, let's get started. Today, you guys are in for a treat. So not only are you guys going to be learning how to read a financial statement, but we're going to actually show you some important financial ratios. And as a bonus, Mark will be showing you how to pull these uh, financial statements from the SEC website. And let's get started. So Now, as you guys know, we always have to have the disclaimer. This lesson is purely for educational purposes only. Statements made by United Traders, UT, or its members are opinions and not investment advice. UT is not responsible for any investment decisions made using the information provided. Improvements are not guaranteed. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situations, or needs, and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on UT. Do not use our advice just for, you know, like we're going to be reviewing a couple of tickers. I don't want you guys to look at the ticker and be like, okay, I'm going to buy it just because we did it in this lesson, only for educational purposes. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to Mark. And Mark is a pivotal member of United Traders. And Mark is going to be doing this lesson. He's worked really hard on this lesson for you guys. And I also want to give a good uh, shout out to Ash. Ash, yeah, in our Discord group is the one who designed this PowerPoint and made it as good as it is right now. And um, just a little bit of information, background information on Mark. He is a quantitative finance major. He is currently also one of our portfolio managers at the Model UT Fund. And he is going to be working at a Canadian pension fund uh, shortly. Now, most of you guys will know Mark uh, under his username, Esoteric Trade Runner. Um, and he's known for his killer entries, especially on those ER plays that we love to buy the dips on. And he is a massive fan of Manchester United. So without further ado, I'll let Mark take over. Thank you, TJ. And thank you guys for joining us. Thank you to Ash as well for designing this PowerPoint. Um, so today we're going to be going through the basics of the financial statements and then diving into financial statement analysis. Now, as a preface to this lesson, um, there are multiple things that we look at when we evaluate a company, right? So we look at the technicals, we look at the valuation, we look at the fundamentals, we look at the catalyst, right? So this is just one of the many things that we take into consideration when we invest in a company. So keep that in mind. But here is the here are the reasons why we do financial statement analysis and why I guess the fundamentals matter to us and what we might do um, in the analysis process. So what we're looking to do is evaluate a company's profitability, liquidity, leverage, efficiency and valuation. Now, valuation is kind of um, an extension of this because you will notice those of you guys that were present for our DCF lesson will notice um, that a lot of aspects that found on financial statements are components of calculating free cash flow. And so you'll see that they're pivotal in valuation. And additionally, while the past does not predict the future, it can certainly be indicative of it. And so um, basically being able to gauge historic probability, profitability, um, growth, we're gonna be able to extrapolate from that and um, you know, make our assumptions based on that. Now, another reason why we're doing financial statement analysis is to be able to spot abnormal things or red flags that might be worth looking into, right? So these might include numbers. You might see a trend of numbers, right? And then you might see an unexpected break of that trend, right? You might see a company have a revenue spike when they sign a new contract, for example, and you're going to want to ask, is this something that is going to repeat itself or is this just a one-time thing, right? Um, you're going to see companies taking out debt. You're going to see um, companies going through restructurings. You're going to see 
um, changes in the financial statements, right? And what you need to know is whether this is something you should be worried about or whether that's something that you can just explain and you don't have to have that in the back of your mind when you're making an investment. And then going forward, really one of the more important things is you ha- when you invest in a company, you form a narrative, right? You form an investment thesis, you craft a story as to why this company will grow or appreciate in value, right? And now what we need to do is find numbers that support that story, right? And these numbers will tell you a story, right? Now that story may match with what you think the story might be, or it may not. And so that's a really important aspect of financial statement analysis. And we're really looking for evidence right behind our assumptions. Finally, um, what we want to do is we want to invest in companies that will be here, right? For three, five, 10 years, right? You might be investing intraday, you might be swing trading, but you need to have the conviction that um, if things go wrong, right, this company will still be here. And more importantly than that is right now, a lot of us are investing based on growth, based on future value. We're investing in companies that some of which don't even have any revenue at all. Um, We're investing in companies with really high growth rates, right? And um, otherwise pretty subpar fundamentally, right? And so what we need to determine is that this company will still be here when it's actually able to grow right into its expectations and um, fulfill its value, right? And so a lot of companies don't really have the staying power to stay in industry, right? Like they go into a competitive space and eventually, right, their margins decline and they have to either go to another product or just uh, go bankrupt, right? So what we want to know is that this is a company that we can hold on to and that our capital can be compounded within this company for years to come. And so we're going to figure out how to um, identify that in this lesson. Now, we're going to be looking at some screen caps of Bloomberg because they break it out um, in a way that is makes it easy, a lot easier to teach. We're going to actually show you how the financial statements look in the filings. But um, and you'll see that they look a lot more different. So there is a framework around how financials should be reported, which is the US gap, right? There's actually the IFRS, which uh, designates, I guess, how financials should be uh, reported internationally, but we're gonna be focusing on the US. Uh, many companies will report uh, financials basically up to the requirements and not really go above and beyond that. and. As an example, when we pull up the Amazon 10K, which is their annual report, uh, and we'll pull up the GoPro 10K, um, you're gonna see one of them is 80 pages long and the other is 400 pages long, right? So there's a lot of flexibility in how much information companies can divulge. That being said, everyone has access to the same information, which is the quarterly reports and the annual report that the company is released. They also probably will release additional press statements, things like that. But the bottom line is that, you know, all this information is found online. It's accessible to all of us, which is really the beauty of investing in the modern day. So the edge will be not in the data that you have, but how you interpret that data. And more importantly is being able to analyze a financial statement will increase your conviction in the investment right so when you have drawdowns when you have a dip like we had just this week you're going to be able to hold on to that investment because you'll be able to say okay this company has high amounts of liquidity this company is profitable um you know so i can hold on to it and that's really what matters to us in the end, right? Because we want to get those compounded returns. And so to be able to do that, we want to be able to hold on to those companies. And um, the, the best companies to hold on to, right, are the companies that dominate, the ones that have competitive advantages and being able to identify that um, increases your edge. All right. So the four statements we're going to be looking at. Um, 
the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, and by extension of the balance sheet, the statement of shareholders' equity. All right. So just to start off with the income statement. So first of all, again, this is the screen cap from Bloomberg for Amazon showing the annual results. Um, and we have it here in a time series because it's actually a lot easier to interpret financial data, right? When it's in, it's in a context, right? But as we go into our analysis, you'll see that there's actually a lot of things that don't immediately hit your eye just because when you're looking at raw numbers, um, it's hard to spot dramatic changes, abnormalities. Um, but to get right into it, um, so the income statement is really just a break. It is a showcase of the company's financial results over a specific period, right? So it could be over a quarter, over sometimes companies will give it to you for over nine months, over six months, right? And over a year in the annual statement. Now, conveniently for us, um, we've, we've been able to do this lesson right after both Amazon and GoPro released their annual results. So here you can see the results up to 2020. Um, and so really the income statement is basically governed by one big equation, right? Which is revenue minus expenses equals income, right? So revenue is the sales that a company brings in and then expenses are the cost that a company incurs in trying to generate that revenue. Um, now you'll see some of the more important components here kind of highlighted um, the cost of revenue. That's the basically the per unit costs or the cost associated with providing um, the, the products and services that a company provides. Um, you also and we're going to talk about margins um, for the, in the lesson. Then you have operating expenses, which represent day to day. Um, expenses that company that are in the normal scope of a company's operations. And you can see some of them outlined there. Um, and after that, we have interest expense subtracted out. And one thing you'll notice is before taxes uh, are subtracted out, interest expenses are subtracted out. And that's because interest expense is tax deductible. Um, from there, um, we can see that we have pretty much, uh, so Amazon doesn't really have minority interest, but actually, if you guys can see my mouse, um, what you do is you subtract the income from minority interest. So these are companies that um, the parent does not own the majority of, right? So usually it'll have to provide the portion of net income uh, generated to the shareholders of the minority portion of that subsidiary. So that's usually netted out. In this case, Amazon owns um, all its subsidiaries outright. And this is actually um, one possible or has been a point of fraud in the past where companies either do consolidate or do not consolidate uh, subsidiaries that they're working with. And it has been a gray area. Um, so Let's continue. Oh, and I guess one more important line here that we'll also touch on in the future, you get the earnings per share, right? And that's really what matters the most. That's why I see it um, highlighted in the earnings result because that is, you know, the amount of earnings that you as an investor are basically able to receive, right? Um, now let's continue here. So now the balance sheet, ba the balance sheet is a representation of a company's financial position at a certain point in time. Now, this means that, so in contrast to the income statement, right, which is, for example, it's cumulative, right? So if you have an annual income statement, right, it's the revenues for the past year in total. Um, here, every quarter, right, you get the most updated version of the balance sheet. So. One thing I actually see surprisingly pretty commonly is analysts using the annual income statement and also using the annual balance sheet when they can just use the balance sheet really from the previous quarter and they're really just uh, using outdated data for some reason. So don't be making that mistake. Um, now here you have the assets 
portion of the balance sheets. Now, this represents um, resources that a company has control of, and it's going to derive an economic benefit from the use of these resources sometimes, sometime in the future. Now, how far into the future that is, is I guess, can be discretionary um, for the company. So that's why this is broken down into current assets and non-current assets, which we're going to talk about in the future. But you can see some of the highlighted aspects here. So cash and cash equivalents, right? That, that's really the most liquid asset that a company can have, right? They're able to deploy this pretty easily and quickly for any type of investment that they might have. Accounts and notes receivable. So this is basically money that the company is owed for work or services that it has rendered and has, has not received, right? So if someone has purchased a good on credit from Amazon, then their accounts and notes receivable is going to go up. Um, then you have inventories, right? That's basically, so this is calculated, right, as the per unit number of units times costs, uh, I guess, generalizing this a lot, I think it's a lot more complex for Amazon, but uh, it basically tells you, right, um, the, I guess, the cost and total value of the merchandise that a company might have. Um, from there, we have property, plants, and equipment, uh, right? So that's basically physical capital that the company operates out of, and it's going to be operating out of this capital for years to come. And so this is where depreciation comes in, right? Because the costs of these assets are written down over time, over the course of their useful life. Now, this is one interesting part, just because, right, when a company acquires a factory, and they have to apply depreciation to it, right? So a company, uh, the value of the, the asset goes down on paper, right? It's not really a cash cost, right? The company isn't really losing money uh, by writing down the value of this asset, but nevertheless, uh, it does impact the income statement, right? And so you'll see that this is actually added back on the cash flow statement and subtracted on the income statement. Now, if this sounds a little complicated, that's okay. Um, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more uh, in the future. We also have intangible assets. This is a really important category, especially now when we're looking at a lot of tech companies, right? There's a lot of assets that you really can't uh, put a value on. And it's actually a big point of contention on how companies come up with this number. And so if that's something you're interested in, if that's something that's important to you, this is something that you can read about how that's valued in the financial statements. And usually um, these assets include things like IP, brand, things like that. And as an extension of that, you have Goodwill, which when a company acquires uh, an asset or another company, right? And it pays a premium for that company above the book value, of that company, right? That's the value recorded. So as a quick example, uh, if I acquire um, a company for 5 mil, but the value of its assets at book value is 2.5 mil, um, I'm gonna record 2.5 mil in uh, Goodwill. And this will actually be evaluated over time to see if the value has decreased. So you'll actually see on the news, this happens. I see it a lot in biotech. I saw it recently happen with Exxon. Um, if a company, uh, uh, the value of a company's assets that it's acquired are declining, right? They have to write down goodwill. And this is actually, they take a, they have to take a hit uh, as a result of that. So never a good thing to see. Let's continue. Um, now I have the liability section. So contrary to the um, assets section, right? Liabilities are basically obligations that a company has to outside parties and um, right it represents an outflow of I guess economic uh, value from the company that the company has to provide in the future right and so here's some of the main ones payables right so if a company has received a service or a product from another party but has not actually paid for it yet this is where you're going to find that number. So 
that is definitely worth looking at. Um, you want to see, uh, you know, definitely how that number is increasing, especially relative to, uh, I guess, the, the assets that a company has. We have short-term debt that's separated from long-term debt. And by definition, that's usually debt that must be paid um, within the year. Uh, then going ahead, we also have the current liability section, which we'll talk about a bit later, but that's pretty much the most major ones. Um, so we're gonna keep going here. All right, next we have the cash flow statement. It's broken out into three different sections, cash flows from operating activities, cash flows from investing activities, and cash flows from financing activities. So the cash from operating activities, you'll see the top line there is uh, net income. So that goes straight from the bottom of the income statement here. And you actually see depreciation and amortization being added first thing here. So as we previously said, this is a non-cash expense. So even though uh, you subtract that depreciation on the income statement, you add it back on the cash flow statement because no cash was actually spent when the depreciation occurred. Um, but going back a little bit, uh, so cash from operating activities, right? That's the cash flow that a company receives from uh, the from its usual operating activities. So from day to day business, right? It's within the regular scope of their business. Now, a lot of companies, there's a lot of types of different businesses. So it's a broad, I guess, definition of what that might be, right? So for example, um, we have the next section actually. So cash from uh, investing activities. Now that's uh, basically cash flow from investments or sales of assets that a company makes, right? So let's say you're a private equity firm and it's part of your business actually to uh, buy and sell companies, right? And so that's actually gonna be in the regular scope of your business. So that might actually be in the cash from operating activities section. Um, now you'll see change in fixed and intangible assets. Uh, so this is actually CapEx, capital expenditures. Those of you guys that were in the DCF lesson will know uh, that that's pretty important, right? That's basically the cash that a company invests in itself. And we like to, we do like to see that being negative, um, right? Because the company is usually reinvesting its earnings. And in this case, it certainly is. Um, you can also see basically any long-term investments. Amazon doesn't have any of those. And then net cash from acquisitions and divestitures. Amazon has not divested any holdings. They've mainly just been making acquisitions. Finally have cash from financing activities. So there you see dividends paid. Um, that's the first thing that is counted there. And you can see Amazon does not have any of those. Um, so this section is based on how a company really funds its operations, how it raises capital, uh, repays capital. And so you can see uh, any buybacks that Amazon has done. And you'll actually see here that for, and I'm actually specifically looking right here, cash repurchase of equity. So Amazon, as you can see, actually does not repurchase equity a lot. And this is actually something I learned when I was doing this lesson, you can look it up. Amazon has not done a single stock buyback for 33 quarters, which is pretty unique. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of really established companies as established as Amazon that have done that. All right. Now, the last part. So one thing I did not mention, and probably one of the most important things, is that um, basically the balance sheet is really governed by one major equation, right? And that is assets equals liabilities plus equity, right? So after the liability liabilities are settled and I guess immediate claims are addressed, right? Capital flows into um, stockholders equity. Now, what is the stockholders equity? That's um, the claim that, uh, you know, that the shareholders have on the company's assets right after all the liabilities have been met so now that applies to us got us the investors right now if you're wondering what you're actually paying for um this is it right so what you're paying for is the earnings after dividends after 
you know, debt has been paid after all the expenses have been paid. Um, right. These are the earnings that a company retains and that enhances the book value of the equity. Right. And so here you have a few sections. So one, one section worth covering here is APIC, right. Additional paid in capital. And that's the, um, capital that is raised through an IPO usually. And th that's the proceeds that, uh, Amazon received there. Uh, you also have treasury stock. So when a company buys back its own stock, uh, that's that amount is noted on its balance sheet. And so as you can see, that amount has not changed. Uh, so that amount of stock is actually, and this is not the amount of stock, it's the par value of the stock. Um, it's noted on its balance sheet. And as you can see, it hasn't changed because Amazon has not done any buybacks to date. Thank you. <laughs> and um, finally, um, as you can see, we have the equity before minority interest. And given that Amazon owns all of its subsidiaries outright, um, it is, there's no, um, I guess, nothing recorded there. Um, so let's move forward. Now, as previously stated, the governing equation of the income statement is revenue minus expenses equals net income. Now, um, why, what do we look for in the income statement and slash what do we get out of it, right? So really the key that we look at is the earnings growth. And by earnings growth, I don't just mean um, the net income, right? I mean the gross margin, the operating margin, right? How those, and obviously the net, net margin, and we're gonna go over those in a second, but um, as you guys saw, right, so the net income, basically, uh, after interest expenses are paid, after taxes are paid, after liabilities are settled, right, after dividends are paid, um, net income, right, turns into retained earnings, right, that a company is able to retain, and it is able to enhance the book value of its own equity, right, and in turn, right, that includes enhances your um your own the sh the very shares that you own yourself right now one thing that might not be clear if you are just being introduced to this topic and you might be wondering what is the book value of equity how is that different from what i pay for a stock right so usually we pay a premium on that equity right because for we want to we don't want the value of the equity today, right? Uh, we want, we are betting on what the value of that equity might be, right? Tomorrow or in a year or in 10 years, right? So that's why we pay a premium, right? Above that book value. And that's the market value of the equity. And that's what we try and predict, right? And um, when we do a DCF, right? That's really the outcome that we're looking for. We're trying to figure out what's a justifiable market value, right? What's a justifiable premium that we should pay to the book value of the equity. So um, in this way, right, um, retained earnings translate also into free cash flow, and that enhances our own stock. So basically, the, the short way of what I'm trying to say here is we want to see um, improving margins, high margins, because in turn, right, we actually get to collect that money um, by owning the shares, right? And that's reflected, I guess, immediately in the EPS, right? The earnings per share. Um, now, we already covered this, income statements are consolidated. Uh, another part here is revenue recognition, right? So now this, um, it's actually a very tricky thing because businesses evolve over time as tech technology is introduced. So actually one new business, um, one new type of business, right, is e-commerce. Um, and so, so for example, right, um, ideally, uh, you recognize revenue, um, I make a sale, you pay me cash for that. And we're both happy you receive your product. Um, and I can record that sale. However, right? Um, first of all, a lot of times, uh, you know, companies don't immediately receive the cash. Sometimes they're paid based on credit. Um, 
sometimes there's you know there's a subscription service right so they're either uh paid up front and then they have to provide the service in the future or vice versa um and it's not that straightforward but even less straightforward is these e-commerce e companies that they don't even really have um they don't really take on the risk of holding inventory a lot of times right because they're really just uh making the sale and so um there's a lot of uh i guess debate on how they should be reporting their revenue and you can actually look this up like am it, this has been an issue of contention for amazon um because right the question is right when do you actually make the sale if you get paid down the road, right? And especially when there's a delivery in between that, right? So so right now, I believe the way it is, is that when, uh, for example, a package arrives at your door and you collect that package, that's when uh, Amazon records a sale. Um, so you guys can read about up about that. There's basically, um, the U.S. GAAP has basically outlined five specific um, conditions that must be hit for um, recording revenue. Um, I don't have that on hand, but uh, it is an interesting read for sure. Now, finally, net income is equal to the bottom line. It is the most important thing, um, right? Because ultimately, as a shareholder, that is what you care about the most. Now we have the GoPro um, income statement here. Um, now I don't wanna go line by line again, just because uh, in the interest of time, but I guess one thing we can talk about is the some of the line items that we haven't really touched on. So that's uh, SGNA, selling general and administrative expenses, right? And as you can see that they actually have that broken down even further into selling and marketing general administrative expenses, right? So again, these are expenses within the regular scope of the business. And one thing we'll be actually looking at is we want to, um, these figures to be able to fluctuate in accordance to the performance of the business, right? So for example, right, um, we had the pandemic, let's say GoPro stops making sales. We want to, we want, that um, them to be able to to see them cutting down on their administrative expenses and we want them to see them cutting down on marketing expenses now if a good example of not seeing something like this is for example um, cable companies right so they're all locked into these uh, contracts right um, so I guess that's actually to their advantage because um, you know, even though demand for their products fell, fell off, uh, they were still able to generate some revenues. But on the other hand, right, if you're locked into that contract, your company that's marketing on TV, um, I guess like sports, uh, I don't know, sports companies, maybe ESPN, I don't know, something like that. But um, right, your, your marketing expenses are going to continue to stay high, even though your revenue completely fell, right? What does that mean? That means that your margins are going to be significantly impacted. And in the end, right, that's means that's going to cut into your net income. Now, what happens when there's negative net income? So actually, what happens is uh, a company must make up the difference, right? They're taking losses, right? So where do those losses actually go? Um, so ultimately, they have to tap into their retained earnings, right? Or the book value of their equity. And you'll actually see, I don't know if this was the case for GoPro, I think it may have been, um, that shareholders equity actually got significantly depleted because they had to tap into that amount in order to take losses. Now, I hope it, this is kind of starting to paint a picture as to why all of this is important with regards to the valuation of a stock. Um, another item is R and D that you can see right there. Now, this is, there's actually a lot of, um, I know TJ actually personally likes seeing R and D go down and SGNA go up, right? And that means that a company has developed its product and now it is, uh, ready to sell that product and market it. Right. And so that's usually, uh, when you want to get into investment, right? And now one of the issues with R&D and actually 
um, there's a lot of prominent investors that are not a fan of R&D, right? And that's because it's not a short thing, right? And that's why we worry, a lot of times we worry about investing in healthcare, biotech especially, right? Because you're counting on that R&D to produce something, right? Um, and if it doesn't, you're going to have cost continuously um, pretty much, you know, eating away at your bottom line. And you will see this amount spike up and back in 2016 when GoPro actually started to go through a restructuring and, you know, it, you can see them put, trying to put more and more money into um, new products. So, um, and again, right, that uh, affects the bottom line. So uh, I think it's a good way to, I guess, approach that analysis. Now, we can keep going here. Um, earnings for share. So as previously mentioned, right, there's, you'll see two types of EPS. You'll see um, regular EPS and you'll see diluted EPS now. So EPS is good. Um, it, it basically tells you, right. Um, basically it divides the net income by the total outstanding shares that a company has. And we know how much income goes for each share. Now this is not reflective of the actual capital structure because there can be convertible bonds. There can be stock options, right? That if exercised, they can actually dilute or increase the shares outstanding, right? Which in turn will actually make your portion of the pie less valuable. That's why if you're wondering why offerings are a bad thing, why stocks tank on offerings, that is why, because the number of shares is increasing. So your, your own share is worth less, right? And so this is a good way of looking at EPS because we can see um, at most, right, if everything's exercised, um, how much are we actually getting? And it it's usually not notable, but if there is a discrepancy between the two, then it absolutely is. All right. So here we have the basic EPS and the diluted EPS for GPRO at the bottom here. And you can see there's not too big of a dis discrepancy. So um, it's not too much to worry about if, if there was a major dilution. Um, also looking at the line um, right here, other adjustments, you'll see 16.5. I don't know what that is. If you see that on like a, on a statement, right? You might want to look into that. And that's where the footnotes will come in, which we'll talk about in a bit. All right. So the various types of margins, we have gross margin, which is revenue minus COGS or cost of goods sold or cost of services provided. Um, now, this is basically, right, a basic measure of how the economy of scale that a company has, right? So the higher gross margins, the better. Um, it means that a company is able to produce its products pretty cheaply, right? Um, and as a result, it also doesn't have to, I guess, and, and by extension, we have operating margin, right? And as previously noted, there's a lot of parts of um, operating expenses, right? SGNA, uh, marketing, right? R&D. So we want to see, I, I think I'm going to be saying uh, we want to high margins a lot here, but um, the idea is, right, if operating margins are high, it means that a company doesn't really have to um, expend a lot of uh, resources, right, in order to get its products off the shelves, right, which is another good thing to see. And it's also known as the EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes. Um, now, if you're wondering what EBITDA is, E-B-I-T-D-A. That's earnings for interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, now, I think one thing, thing worth noting here is a lot of investors prefer EBITDA. Why is that? That's because, um, you know, first of all, if you do have a lot of depreciation, right, uh, that's going to change the picture for you. And so as a result, a lot of investors think that it's better to just not... Uh, it's better to just add that back in um, since it is a non-cash expense as well. So if you have, for example, an industrials company 
right? They're going to have a lot of factories. They're going to have a lot of PP and E. So they're going to have a lot of depreciation. Now, um, if you just want to compare the, I guess, performance of the, of two like, industrial companies and one of them has a lot of PP and E and one of them doesn't, right? Uh, that will kind of net out that effect. So just keep that in mind. Um, we covered operating expenses, right? They're within the usual uh, scope of usual business activities. Um, we also have non-operating expenses. Now, this is extraordinary in items. So what might those be? Um, so for example, uh, restructuring, right? That's, a, I guess, extraordinary um, item. Also, you might have losses, right? Uh, you might have uh, employees uh, leaving, things like that. So it's, it's uh, operating expenses that are unusual and infrequent, but uh, not both. And finally have the net margin, which is net income. So a lot of people ask like, oh, which one is the most important? Um, you know, they're all important. And hopefully now you know why. All right. And um, we're going to keep going here. So, I mean, now you guys can see gross profit, operating income, net income. That's basically the three important ones. Um, so one of the reasons why you also want to be looking at operating income over net income is the fact that if a company has a lot of business segments, right, um, it's going to be First of all, it's going to be paying tax, right, uniformly, right? So Amazon generates, let's say, like $100 billion in revenue in a quarter. Um, it's going to pay, I don't know, 10% tax. Probably not. But if they are, uh, they're going to pay 10% uh, tax, right, on all of that. So if you're looking at net income, right, you're, you're not actually being able to see I guess, which uh, segments, right, drive the bulk of the profits, which ones are the most profitable. Um, and so, right, EBIT is earnings before interest and tax expenses, right? So also, if a company has a lot of debt, uh, right, that's going to obscure the results. But here you see, actually, interestingly enough, right, when Amazon started to report um these various categories, right? So AWS, he only started reporting that in 2013. And you might wonder like when a company actually does start reporting that. And that's when uh, the results, the, I guess, the revenue that that segment brings in is pretty material to the company. So they have to disclose that to investors. Now, Amazon is actually pretty notorious for not doing that. Um, so as you can see, for a while, they actually only had two segments and three, and now they finally disclose their global retail sales. And you can see the margins for each of those sections. So from that, we're going to be able to see that um, AWS is by far the most profitable, right? They have a 26% operating margin, um, and that's helpful for us to investors because now we know what's going to drive the most profit for Amazon. All right, so um, continuation for the discussion of the balance sheet. So we have current assets and liabilities, right? Now, what defines a current asset or current liabilities? That's assets that are expected to be sold or used within 12 months or normal operating cycle for the company. Um, and then contrary, right? You have the non-current assets, right? That's, I think it's a good definition for the infrastructure from which the entity operates. And, you know, these assets are not consumed or sold um, in the short term, right? So I think that is a good definition. And I, one of the reasons why we have these definitions is because the scope of these are pretty broad, right? Um, and we're, we're going to go through some examples in a second. Um, and we also have non-current liabilities, right? So that's mainly long-term debt. All right, so um, we previously covered this for Amazon. This is the asset section for GoPro. Um, now, we, accounts receivable, we talked about that. Inventories, we talked about that. Uh, one of the things we did not talk about is deferred tax assets. So that's right there in the bottom left. Um, so that's usually 
when a company has uh, pay taxes in advance, right? That means it won't have to really pay tax in the future. I think this was a significantly larger figure for Amazon. Um, uh, GoPro really doesn't have that, but you're going to see that on the other side um, of the balance sheet with the uh, liabilities where you have deferred tax liabilities, right? Meaning that a company has not paid taxes that it will have to in the future. And now there's a lot of reasons as to why this, uh, might happen a lot of it occurs with like the timing of revenue recognition and uh, income that the company records um i think that pretty much covers it um let's see here you can see actually accumulated depreciation being subtracted from uh, the pp e uh, which we talked about previously as to why that is the case All right, and liability. So as previously stated, you also actually have the deferred revenue section right there, right? So again, it's uh, it's usually it's I think it I would say it's a little bit um, it's it's yeah right there. So um, that's basically um, like revenue that the company has um, not received yet, right? And it's a liability uh, because Basically, if you don't collect it, right, it's not revenue. Um, so you also have, so you have two entries actually of deferred revenue, one short term, one um, long term. So uh, you have to collect on the short term one. Um, and you also have, right, short term debt, long term debt, accrued taxes, right? So as previously said, um, right, that's a liability. Um, basically, that's taxes that have to be paid, um, right, and that have accumulated, they're paying their deferred tax liabilities, um, right, that they haven't paid yet, um, and they'll have to in the future, right. So as previously stated, liabilities are, um, you know, the depletion of economic resources at the firm, right, that it will eventually, there'll be an outflow, right, of assets at the firm. Um, okay, so I think that covers it all. Let's continue. All right, so working capital. Now, again, the people that are in the DCF lesson will know what working capital is, but it is the excess of current assets over current liabilities. So it's representative of how easily a company might be able to meet its short-term obligations, right? Um, and this is a good indicator, right, of liquidity. In fact, there is a current ratio, which is current assets over current liabilities. Now, one thing is that a lot of people might be like, okay, liquidity is good. So we want to see as high of a current ratio or as high as a working capital as possible. That's not true because right, you don't want assets really just sitting there. Uh, I think it might be an advantage because for example, like a lot of companies have huge piles of cash right now. Um, and you know, we wanted to actually, if you were along something going into um, the pandemic, right, you'd want to be long in companies that have high piles of cash because they're going to be able to deploy that opportunistically. But most of the time you want to see, um, you know, a, a level where they're able to cover their current liabilities, but you, don't, you also don't have these high liquid resources just sitting there, right? Because a company should just be reinvesting that um, into its own operations. And so if they're not doing that. Um, that's not a good sign. All right, now it's pretty simple. You're just taking current assets and uh, subtracting it from uh, current liabilities. And uh, it's really stated, you can see what goes in to um, the, the two of those. All right, we basically covered this. Um, let's see. Yeah, so one thing I'll point out here is the retained earnings being negative, right? So that's when I believe GoPro was uh, taking a loss, right? 
So what that means is that the book value of the equity actually gets depleted. You also notice that GoPro had preferred stock. They eventually cut that out. But if you're wondering what that is, usually um, preferred stock, um, right? That's a level above, I guess. Um, so, so basically in the capital structure, right? You have debt, you have equity, right? So if a firm was to go bankrupt, the debt holders would be paid off first, then the equity holders, right? So it's a lot more risky to be an equity holder. But um, if there's a preferred stock, right? The dividends on the stock will be paid off to the preferred stockholders first. Um, and there might actually be, I, th I think there might be some voting um, features associated with that. Um, but yeah. Um, so I, I think the one notable thing is that you can actually see the fluctuation in GoPro's retained earnings. Um, you know, negative, positive, negative again, still negative. So they're on the brink of profitability. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a bit. Oh, and Mark? Yep. So uh, it's the other way around. Preferred shares don't give you voting rights. Common uh, shares, common stock, uh, those give you voting rights. The reason why people go with preferred shares is because it works kind of like a bond, right? Just as you explained, they get paid off um, before the uh, common uh, stockholder. Got you. That makes sense. So I guess um, in the case of a stock like Palantir, for example, right, if we have multiple classes of shares, right, those are all common stock, right? Yeah. All right. Makes sense. All right. So going on to the cash flow statement. So as we previously stated, right, um, income statements, uh, they feature, right, re revenue is recognized now when the cash is collected. But once the sale is completed, now there's like a lot of definitions around how that's determined. But the, the bottom line really is that um, it's not reflective of the cash being received by the business, right? And so for that, we actually have the cash flow statement. And uh, one thing to be noted is you have the non-cash expenses being recognized, right? So depreciation is one of those. It's added back. It's not, even though it does count as expense because eventually that asset will have to be replaced. So that's kind of their way of accounting for that. Um, uh, right. It's not an actual cash expense, so it has to be added back. It does not reflect, right, the cash uh, difference, I guess. Um, and just to skip ahead for a second. So it doesn't have it here, but in the end, right, you sum your cash from operating activities, from investing activities, from financing activities, right? And you get your net change in cash, right? overall um, it would be probably below that line ideally um, and uh, so that you actually see is the difference between the cash position on the current version of the balance sheet and the previous version of the balance sheet so that's how that is updated but going back here so um, if we want to analyze the cash flow statement what we really care about is First of all, what is the major source of cash, um, whether it is from operating activities, from financing activities or investing activities, right? So if a company doesn't actually, like it's not able to collect any cash or generate any cash, um, it might rely on financing, right? It might rely on issuing debt or issuing equity in order to raise cash, right? And so you're going to see the majority of their cash flow coming from the um, cash flow from financing uh, section, right? Um, what we want to see is we want to see the majority of cash flow is coming from operating activities, right? Because that will mean that, right, um, we're really, the business is running how it should be. The main source of cash is the actual operations, right? It's not investors supplying the company with money or the company like benefiting from a one-time sale of an asset. So let's say for example, like Tesla was not, <laughs> not uh, consistently 
generating a profit right by selling credits and they actually just sold that 1.5 billion bitcoin position right and they recorded a gain from that in cash um right we'd see that uh in the cash from investing activities section right now that's not sustainable right so um we'd want to see it in the ocf and for young companies it's okay um, because they might not be generating cash but as a company matures we want to see them uh really become their own main source of cash generation because ultimately as shareholders that's what we care about um, now evaluating the cash flow statements helps you with um, evaluating the liquidity solvency and financial flexibility of the company um, basically how well a company is able to meet its uh, short, uh, short-term long-term obligations and how i guess easily it's first of all it's able to deploy and collect um, the cash how how long it takes cash to actually cycle through the company and we're going to actually take a look at that in a second for gopro um all right so we've mainly covered all these sections looking at the amazon um but you can actually just see like that gopro first of all their capex right change in fixed and intangible assets right it's, it's relatively low um and aren't first of all that definitely is as an extension of them uh uh right just uh it, it's it's low because they don't generate as much revenue obviously but you can see a trend there you can see that capex ramp up as it basically went through restructuring as previously stated around 2015 2016 now it's shifting to a less capital intensive model it's still producing obviously the cameras but also has that subscription service right so that capex declined now whether it's a good thing it's hard to tell just looking at this right because we do want to see companies reinvesting in themselves um you can also see that um, GoPro hasn't really made a lot of acquisitions. It tried doing acquisitions uh, to turn its business around. That did not work. Um, and yeah, you, know, you also have the change in non-cash working capital. We previously just talked about uh, what that is, right? Um, that's basically current assets minus current liabilities, but and the change in that. Um, but it's also just netting out uh, like, right? The cash and because some people think that or i guess for some for some people it's uh useful to evaluate working capital without cash in it because it is the most liquid um part of that um and so as you can see what goes into there accounts receivable inventories um, we cover that right and the change of non-cash working capital um it's either going to be positive or negative and if it's positive right that means a company is just able to basically generate uh cash uh from conducting its business but if it's positive uh, if it's negative then that means that a company must spend money to make money right and uh we want to we like seeing that being positive um all right 